A Radical Look at Scottish History with Stuart McHardy. Part 20. The King That Left. Crown King of Scots at the age of 13 months. James VI was 16 when he took effective control of Scotland in 1582. Raised as a Protestant, one of his tutors was the redoubtable scholar and historian George Buchanan, who believed there were, or certainly should be, limits on the power of kings. His influence did not last. The regents, who were in charge during James's young life, were a mixed bag. All Protestants, but the infighting was vicious and at least three of them met violent deaths, reflecting the ongoing unsettled state of the nation in the aftermath of the Reformation. However, as soon as he took control, James showed himself to be a strong, if not willful, character. Within a year of taking control, he passed acts restoring bishops in Scotland, and despite the opposition to this, he managed to avoid open armed resistance. Bringing back bishops, mainly to help bolster his own authority, ran directly against the teachings of Buchanan, and was a forerunner of things to come. This may well have been influenced by the fact that he had briefly been imprisoned after taking the throne as part of a successful power struggle to remove the then regent, the Earl of Lennox, in an episode known as the Ruthven Raid. It also seems to have influenced his thinking, as he began writing about the role of kingship in the 1590s, something which led to the development of the theory of the divine right of kings, which was to cost so many lives over the ensuing decades. In his own words, the state of monarchy is the supremest thing upon earth, for kings are not only God's lieutenants upon earth and sit upon God's throne, but even by God himself are called gods. Not a shrinking violet hour, Jimmy. This doctrine, of course, was part of the root cause of the troubles that were to engulf Scotland, England and Ireland for most of the next century. The centuries of constant threat of southern invasion were coming to an end during James's reign because of his relationship to Queen Elizabeth I of England, his great-grandmother having been Henry VIII's elder sister Margaret, and of course Elizabeth herself had no direct heir. From the late 1580s onwards, James was actively pushing his case at the English court, and the fact that he refused to intervene in either the trial or execution of his mother in England in 1587 obviously did his cause no harm. A considerable part of the reason Mary had been seen as dangerous was that she had been a Catholic, whereas James, having been raised as a Protestant, was considered a suitable candidate to be King of England. Not having to be constantly on the lookout for military activity to the south of the border, gave James time to devote himself to other pursuits. Apart from his own literary endeavours, which were considerable, he was a noted patron of the arts and had many poets at his court, mainly writing in Scots, and his own talents meant he considered himself one of them, the group known as the Castilian Band. The most remembered of them nowadays would be Woody Montgomery. This patronage of indigenous culture, particularly in Scots, sadly did not last, as James increasingly began to look to the south, not in fear of invasion, but in hope and the expectation of things to come. Trouble may not have been looming in the south, but Scotland was still not a settled kingdom, and even though the Lordship of the Isles was now a thing of the past. Ongoing struggles with the tribal societies of the Highlands and Islands continued. Unlike his direct predecessors, James did not have the Gallic, and with the support of the Lowland Lairds who made up his court, it is in this period that we can see the start of the process of trying to destroy the culture of the Gallic-speaking parts of his kingdom. It wasn't just an attack on the Gallic language, but an attempt to deal with a kin-based warrior society whose warrior and raiding practices made them a constant potential threat to national politics and centralised control. He organised several direct invasions of the Isle of Lewis as an example, with the avowed intention of settling it with lowland lairds and their followers, and despite the original lack of success, kept at it with some level of success. In 1609, after exceeding the English throne, he eventually passed the Statutes of Iona, which were a direct attack on the ancient tribal structure of clan society. Under those acts, the clan chiefs were supposed to provide for Protestant ministers, to send their eldest sons to the lowlands, to be educated in Protestant schools, 
where the education would be in Scots or English, and generally to bow the knee to centralised control in Edinburgh. This, of course, led to considerable trouble and the direct annexation of all of the lands of Orkney and Shetland to the Crown, but it did not actually destroy Highland society. That had to wait till after Culloden. Now, given the necessity of having an heir, James had married Princess Anne of Denmark in 1589 in Oslo. On their return journey to Leith, they ran into a powerful storm in the Firth of Forth. This storm was said to have been raised by a coven of witches based in North Berwick, and James used the 1563 Witchcraft Act to bring them to trial. Now, the persecution of so-called witches in Scotland, which ran from the time of the Act well into the 18th century, is a black stain on our nation's past, a process notable for its religious fanaticism and rampant gynophobia. The king seems to have been particularly fascinated by the subject, even writing a book on the subject called Demonology, which he had published in 1597. It is generally reckoned it was this fascination, some have said obsession, that led to Willie Shakespeare penning the Scottish play, also known as Macbeth, which had its own disastrous effect on the understanding of Scotland's past. Now, although James's rule in Scotland was not as disrupted as it might have been, there were still deep-running feuds and hatreds. In 1600, there was an incident that has gone down in history as the Gowrie Conspiracy. Now, two years after the Ruthven Raid of 1582, in which James had been imprisoned, and in which Queen Elizabeth of England had apparently played a part, he had had one of the leaders of the raid, the Earl of Gowrie, executed. An incident took place in 1600 at Gowrie House, when the Earl's successor, John Ruthven, and his younger brother Alexander were killed, after Alexander had supposedly attempted to assassinate the king. That there was bad blood between the king and the Ruthvens is certain, and it also seems that James owed them a lot of money. This episode, known as the Gowrie Conspiracy, has been the subject of much speculation over the years. Rumours did circulate that it was a set-up by the king, but it may in fact be one of those times in history where things came about more because of a cock-up than a conspiracy. By this time, Elizabeth of England was in failing health and approached the age of 70. She had always been reluctant to name her successor, but it was generally thought that James was the natural choice. To that end, the English courtiers led by Robert Cecil, who had inherited his position as the Queen's senior advisor from his father, were communicating with James, effectively offering him the throne of England on the death of Elizabeth. For some political reasons, Cecil and his colleagues wanted a smooth transition when the Queen eventually passed on. The underlying volatility of a society still beset with religious problems was to show itself subsequently, but James was as desperate as the members of the English ruling classes to have things worked out. So it was the very day that Elizabeth died, 24th of March 1603, the court immediately moved to have James declared as James I of England. England was now embarking on its centuries-long worldwide process of imperial expansion, and as its king, James could now see himself as a player on the world stage. The fact that he wanted effectively to combine the two countries into one caused considerable friction with the English Parliament, and was not popular back here either, and set off a decades-long history of struggle between royal and parliamentary power that was to have dire consequences. Despite various promises before he moved to England that he would regularly return to Scotland, James came back just once, setting a pattern that has lasted ever since. And that pattern clearly shows that despite the specific legal situation concerning two sovereign states, as far as anyone in the seat of power in London is concerned, what was the Union of Crowns up to the merging of the two parliaments in 1707, was never meant to be a marriage of equals. A radical look at Scottish history will return later in the year. <laughs> <laughs>